Woo. All right, y'all can grab a seat. Welcome, welcome. How is everyone doing today? Good? All right. So, uh, hey, my name is Justin Warrens. I'm the lead pastor here, and I just want to welcome you. I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Now, uh, I don't know about you, but for me, I was talking, I said this as uh, Andrew was walking in. Uh, we were talking about how Christmas is already here, right? Christmas is already here. I don't know if you subscribe to that experience, but for us in our family, we love Christmas. How many of you love Christmas? Like the whole season, the peppermint mochas, like you got your Starbucks Christmas cup as fast as you could. Anyone here? Uh, oh, I, I just quick, quick question, right? How many of you love to cut down your own tree? How many, you go to the farm, you cut it down. Okay, how many of you love the artificial tree that doesn't shed over your entire house? You're laughing at everyone else. I hear you. I can hear it in you. See, the thing about Christmas, I find, is it's this idea of tradition. And in our family, I think I have to love it because my wife is from Frankenmuth. So um, I, have no, I have no option but to love everything about Christmas, everything about Christmas. But, you know, I'm excited about this season. We're, we're kicking off today this new series called Advent. And if you grew up in a, maybe a traditional uh, faith uh, community, you have been a part of Advent, you've experienced Advent, and you know it's this journey of expectation about what is to come in uh, the coming of Christmas and Jesus and the story that we celebrate uh, and that we tie our faith to is, is absolutely incredible. But maybe you're like me and you didn't grow up with that. So today my hope is in this series is an encouragement, maybe a new look to approach Christmas and the Christmas season. One of the things that we're going to do in this journey uh, today, we actually have something really cool out in the lobby. We have the opportunity for you to make an Advent platter as a family, uh, as a community that you, you get to decorate one and make that for your family. It'll be a really great treat. But also one of the things we're going to do throughout the series is uh, a digital devotional. And so here's one of the moments I'd love for you to pull out your phone and uh, I want you to get, be able to receive these, this digital devotional just as a journey throughout the next few weeks uh, as we build with that anticipation towards Christmas and also something to encourage us. So if you put the phone number 248-781-2639 in your text messages, that's 248-781-2639, and you text the word ADVENT, to that number, we're going to be providing a digital devotional throughout the week that maybe just encourages you a couple times a week, gives you a little bit of maybe that just renewed perspective as you walk through your day. So that's a, a great opportunity to join us on this journey throughout the next couple weeks. One thing I want to mention uh, just for you with, with children and family, one of the things that's happening this week, you're going to see it on our Facebook page, uh, is we're hosting a Kensington Kids event of faith and anxiety conversation. How do you navigate some of the anxieties that we face, especially in children? Um, and so we have some incredible experts and, and uh, people of wisdom who are going to help journey with us. You can check that on our Facebook page this week. Now, if you're new, one of the things I want to let you know about is we have a place called The Hub. We'd love for you to stop by and, and ask some questions, meet some of our team, and uh, maybe we help you take this journey along with us. So for those of you who have been a part of Kensington, you know this, that we, we get to this point at the year end where we start talking about some of the ways that your generosity has had an impact in our community. And I am so excited for today's film. And we show these films of stories of impact and what God is doing in and through our community at this season. And today's story is one out of our partnership in Afghanistan. And this has been one of the most... Um, uh, ones this season that have been so important and crucial that we've been navigating together as a community. And so my hope for you is that you know that this is a part of what we as a community are a part of in and around the world, that we're having an impact both locally and globally. So I want you to watch this film with us and enjoy the, the ways that God is moving in and through our community. So I'm Jeff Gibson. I am the president of Big Life, and we have been a ministry for over 20 years now in the United States. And the, the ministry and its name really got started from a question in a book that was talking about the 1040 window and the vast amount of lostness in this area of the world where two out of every three people live, and yet uh, most people have never even heard the name of Jesus Christ. But the question was posed, are you leading a little life in your own little world? or are you willing to lead a big life with a big kingdom impact? The mission of Big Life is to empower believers worldwide to reach and disciple their own people for Jesus Christ. 
In about 2008, 2009, we started in Central Asia. The Lord actually provided a, uh, a jihadist who was on his way uh, to fight jihad in Afghanistan one day. He had stopped on the side of the road to grab a cup of tea in a tea stall, which is really just, you know, a small little hut and a, and a bench on a dusty road. And he was sipping his cup of tea. And in his words, he said he looked down at his feet and there was some some paper that was swirling down at his feet and he felt like there was like a light shining on this paper. And the words that's, that were written on the paper are, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are the poor in spirit. And he knew these were the words out of a Bible, but he'd never seen a Bible before. But the Lord so convicted his heart that he did not continue on his trip that, that time to Jihad. He turned around, he goes back home. And for the next two years, he was seeking out who wrote these words? Who said these words? And he finally was put in, uh, in touch. The Lord provided a way uh, for someone to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he became a believer. And um, we were contacted back in the United States. Our, our founder, John Harrimo, went over there and met with this, this person. He said, the, the Lord has told me that I should go back into the extremist, the Taliban region, and reach people for Jesus Christ. And we was like, you're crazy. And he goes, no, this is what the Lord's told me to do. He says, promise me that you'll train me, that you'll pray for me, and that you'll take care of my family when they kill me. And now in Afghanistan, because of the obedience of this one person, we have over 11,000, almost 12,000 believers now uh, underground in the country of Afghanistan. What I always love about our indigenous leaders in these areas is they don't view the Muslims as their enemy. They say they just don't know truth yet. We didn't know truth, and that's how we acted before we knew truth. So now we need to reach these brothers and sisters and let them know who the, who the gospel truth is, which is Jesus Christ. A Muslim is taught that you can't read the Bible because the Jews and Christians have corrupted it and it can't be trusted. So even though they're told we should read it, they're also told verbally, don't read it, it's been corrupted. But what our leaders will look for when they find these people who are hungry, who may want to read the Bible, and they say, oh, I can't because it's corrupted. They say, what if I had an uncorrupted version? Because I do, and I can give it to you. And uh, the Bibles are actually the number one request we have had on the field in Central Asia for the last eight years. Every year our Bible budget goes up. There was one year we actually distributed over 100,000 Bibles, but we've been averaging between 70 and 85,000 Bibles per year. And we've seen so many Muslims come to faith because they, they read these Bibles, usually in secret. They can't come home and say, I have a Bible, whatever, but to, to give them God's word and to let the truth of the gospel penetrate their hearts. So a few months ago, we all know from the news what happened in Taliban with the U.S. forces pulling out and the chaos which has ensued. We saw immediate needs right away. Obviously, it was on the news that people were trying to escape. You know, we saw the planes taking off uh, from Kabul to try to get out and people desperately trying to get on those planes. It was heartbreaking. What was amazing is, is we had people starting to contact Big Life saying, um, you guys are gonna need some help. We're gonna start raising some money. We had people outside of our organization that just started raising money for us. Kensington Church stepped up and said, we need to help with this as well. And we need to send you some money to help with this rescue effort. So we started to bring some people across the border. Uh, at, the, at the very start of this, I wouldn't say it was easy, but it wasn't extremely difficult to get some people. Now, uh, there was all kinds of different situations. If they had family inside Pakistan or friends and they could go there, we would help them get there. If they had no contacts, we were finding places for them to live. The people that have been relocated within Afghanistan, uh, right now there's about 8,000 that are, that are located in a certain area. We're feeding them all the time. So we're getting money in to buy food to feed them. Other people you know, that are coming across the border, we've rented some rental homes for them. We're putting some in the uh, refugee camps. We're putting some with friends and family. And some, if they have the right paperwork, we can take them right to the U.S. Embassy. We have 8,000 we've relocated in the country, over 3,000 we've helped get out of the country. Out of those 8,000 are still there, we believe many of them will still want to come. We just don't have any paperwork on them yet. In fact, there's, there's this one family, and there's, there's two daughters and two sons uh, 
relatively young, like un under teenage years. And uh, we were trying to find a way to bring them all across, but they were scared, they said, because if we get stopped by the Taliban, understand, they're gonna take these two boys and make them suicide bombers. And they're gonna take these two girls and make them wives. And they asked us, can you guarantee that you can get them across safely? <laughs> we cannot do that. You know, it's, it's dangerous for people. We understand, they, you know, they don't want to leave the container, but at some point they're going to have to. It's, it's, a, it's a tough situation for all those involved. In the morning before work, I like to go out on my patio, especially in the summer, and uh, read the Bible. As I was reading, uh, my phone was beeping and, and kind of going nuts and I clicked on it and, and saw tweets and everything about the Afghan refugees trying to get out of Afghanistan and that really stuck with me and at the same time kind of stirring was uh, a feeling like I need to be more active um, in my faith but just this feeling of not really being connected I just said uh, a quick prayer God if if you want me to get involved in this, just really make it obvious that while well, I'm going to look up what um, charities are involved with this. Found a um, Lutheran charity on the East Coast and, and from there I saw that they were connected with um, Samaritas here in Michigan. Talked to the receptionist there and they connected me with uh, Kelly Dobner. She explained to me that a lot of um, refugees were, were coming to the Detroit area and that Samaritas was one of the leading aid agencies. And I thought, well, maybe I can tell my church about this. Maybe I can tell some of my friends, my, some of my networks. And she was like, oh yeah, what church do you go to? And I said, oh, Kensington, Troy. And she said, uh, oh, I've already been in touch with Kensington, Troy. And uh, we have a meeting this upcoming week. And to me, um, that was kind of the handball across the head like yes you're you're this is something you you should be um involved with our team itself has 22 volunteers but i know uh, kensington as a whole has uh, over 150 so the response has been uh, way more than we ever ever imagined we're excited and anxious and kind of feeling like we're in over our heads a little bit but also um really I'm excited to see what God has planned. Um, the biggest risk, like selfishly, is our time. Like to me and our family, like our time is the most valuable thing. And uh, and now we're committing a chunk of time for six months. So selfishly, that's the biggest risk. Um, we'll see what God has planned, and and maybe it'll it will become a regular thing. Um, we'll see. Whenever I ask them, you know, what message do you want me to take back? They always say, please thank everyone. Please thank them from the bottom of our heart because we know they're praying and we know that we can continue to do what we're doing because of what they're doing. They are still hearing and seeing believers in the northern area still being slaughtered. Uh, so that's happened. Uh, we have lost four leaders in this operation that have been killed by the Taliban and there was a complete family of 10 uh, that were crossing one time and they were all killed. This situation is gonna go on for some time to come. Uh, we're planning uh, for a couple years down the road for as far as relocating people. This is still a desperate problem over there. We ask you to keep it at the forefront of your mind. Keep praying for these people. Pray for our leaders who are out truly risking their lives to bring people they don't even know sometimes across the border because their safety day by day is always in question and, and the situation can change in a moment's notice it oftentimes does. When we began our partnership in Afghanistan, it was something vague and unknown. We knew people were gonna to come to Christ, we knew there was gonna be all these challenges, but it was something we would invest from a distance. But in this last year, what was far away, Jesus Christ has brought right into our lives. And your response in this year has absolutely overwhelmed me. I mean, the giving to see thousands of refugees in danger of their lives, escape into other countries, 
It's been, been so beautiful. And now added to that has been this willingness to step into relationship with Afghani refugees that are coming into our country. We are literally getting to be like Jesus. As Jesus walked with us, we're getting to walk with these amazing people. And it's still an unknown. We don't understand. We're going to learn, but we're going to see Jesus Christ move. And when you make a year-end Christmas gift to Kensington, you're hearing all kinds of opportunities. But I'm telling you, this is an adventure that we never knew we could be on. And it's at the epicenter of world news and of what Jesus Christ is doing in the world. And I'm inviting you to join us again in an amazing adventure where we continue to do what we've always done, step from the unknown into the known with Jesus Christ. It's pretty overwhelming, isn't it? Just to think about what an impact we get to have together. And one of the coolest parts of being able to be here today with all of you and share that year-end giving video is uh, we have Dr. Moore here with us today. And one of the cool parts of our, our relationship, as many of you know, Dr. Moore has been a partner of Kensington for many of years and uh, his community, Tree of Life. Uh, him and I have been talking throughout this past couple years, and um, as we talked about it, this is one of the things that their community has partnered with us to be a part of this partnership. So we're watching this video, and Dr. Moore's like, I cannot wait to show that video to our community as well, because they are a part of that story. And I just think that, uh, when we're reminded, uh, I think what, uh, what Stephen said was really in interesting. He said, the biggest risk to us is our time. And I was thinking about just as, what we get to do as a community, when we're generous with our time, when we're generous with our life, we get to give life. Isn't that incredible? That when we step outside of just our normal every day and we get to be a part of incredible stories that are changing the world. And when I talk with this with my children about what we as a church get to be a part of, I love this year-end Christmas gift book because I get to show them. I get to show them the stories the communities, that it's not just about gathering here. It's about having an impact everywhere and saying, God, what are you doing in us that you want to do through us? So one of the reasons why we share these videos with you, why we share this kind of vision is because this is what we're inviting you to be a part of with our community, to have an impact through your generosity in this season, to have an impact throughout the world. And so um, you got one of these as you walked in. I would just encourage you to look through it. I love seeing just the different ways we get to be a part of life change. Next week, like um, as I was looking through this, one of the ones next week is the one on Nepal. We get to share the story of Nepal in this season. And I just, it overwhelms me every time to say this is what we get to be a part of. And so my hope to you is this is an encouragement let you know this is what we get to do together. And so there are a couple different ways to give if you see that, uh, as you consider and pray about in these next couple weeks, God, what is it that you're gonna move in us as a community and how do we get to be generous together? And we're just so grateful for your partnership. With that, we're in this series that we're leading up to Christmas, this hopeful expectation of Advent, of light breaking through. And I don't know in, in this season if you, if you find it difficult to find hope, if you find it, um, if you struggle with it, or if, if things have just kind of gotten a little wonky in your life. I feel like for me this week, our family, we dealt with some rough moments. Our water heater went out on Thanksgiving morning and started spilling out into the, into the basement. And I'm like, and nothing in me wants to deal with that, right? You're like, of course, Thanksgiving morning, great. Sent my family to to my parents' house and then stayed back connecting with a plumber. And then this plumber, just in his generosity, said, yeah, I'll come over and I'll help. You know what's perspective for me is like when we're human towards one another, when we're loving, when we're gracious, we get to experience a more beautiful picture of humanity. And almost in that moment for me, hope was restored again. And I hope that today as we're leading in this Advent journey of reimagining what Advent, this expectation of Jesus coming, that hope would be restored in you today.
government will be on his shoulders and he will be called wonderful counselor mighty god everlasting father prince of peace of the greatness of his government and peace he will reign on david's throne and over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever the zeal of the lord almighty will accomplish this. to the earth. 
Well, good morning, Kensington. It is great to be here. I am Pastor Eric Moore of Tree of Life Bible Fellowship, and I am always honored to be here. And I just want to say, uh, Justin, actually, when he was speaking, he was bringing tears to my eyes. You know, one of the things that we love about partnering with Kensington is that Kensington has such a great vision, a big vision. And uh, just to let you know, this is not part of my message. This is actually just coming from my heart right now. Um, you have such a big vision, and for a church of our size, a smaller church, is really just a, um, a blessing to be able to partner with you as you do these great things around, uh, around the globe. So uh, Afghanistan, our church, we gave a significant amount of money for us. We gave sacrificially to try and help get some of those Afghans out of uh, Afghanistan, and just to see that, see that video was really overwhelming to know that uh, we had a small part in that. So I just want to encourage you. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not getting paid for this. This is, not, this is not a commercial announcement. I'm just saying that I think uh, you are part of a great, a great ministry. Uh, with that said, wasn't this an awesome Thanksgiving weekend? I mean, I, I was thinking about this weekend. I was just overjoyed. Uh, for those of you who are Spartans, Michigan State beat Penn State this weekend. And I was like, yes, that's the way to go, man. And then U of M, we crushed Ohio State. Yes, you know. And then the Detroit Lions, they, wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm sorry. I, I got confused there. I got a little caught up. But the, the, I don't know if you were part of the Thanksgiving parade or you had the opportunity to see it or whatever. And so, uh, you know, one of the things about the Thanksgiving parade, which is interesting, is that they do a lot of good volunteer work. And they have a, a float, which uh, Kresge and also Ka Kellogg uh, partner with, and it's called Hope Starts Here. And so as I was looking at that float and the theme of the float, it just kind of reminded me of, of hope during the Christmas season, because Christmas is or Advent season is a time of hope. And one of the things I thought, well, what does hope mean for the believer? What does hope mean for those of us who are in Jesus Christ as we come to this Christmas Advent season? And so what I'm going to do today is that this is kind of the whole Advent theme. We're going we're gonna to walk with the prophet Isaiah as he helps us to understand Christ's first coming. And if you're not familiar with Isaiah, I want you to invite you to turn to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6, and we're going to look at Isaiah the prophet, his calling. Now, Isaiah lived some 700 years before uh, Jesus came, but God used him to prophesy or to tell of Jesus coming. And so one of the things I, I, I love is about Isaiah's calling, uh, that, that the Lord called Isaiah into the ministry. Now, Isaiah served under four different kings, and, and, and the first king that he was under was King Uzziah, but Uzziah died, and, and God hadn't really called him uh, to be a prophet to the nation at that time. He was just serving up under King Uzziah. And so we pick it up here in Isaiah chapter 6, starting in verse 1. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings they covered their faces. With two they covered their feet. And with two they were flying, and they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. Now, I just want to stop right there. We're going to keep going, but I just want to stop right there. This is an awesome vision and an awesome calling. And, and, and I feel sometimes we come to passages like this and we read them, but we don't allow them to impact us. Isaiah was serving the Lord in, in his capacity, but and when King Uzziah died, God gave him a vision. A vision of him sitting on the throne in heaven. And, and, and around him are these myriad of angels that call seraphim who have six wings. And, and God is so holy, he is so holy, that the angels themselves cannot bear to look on the Lord. Six wings, 
With two, they cover their eyes. With two, they cover their feet. And with two, they fly. And they're calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the others say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And their voices are so powerful that it shakes the very foundations of the temple. It would be as if the band was up here and they struck a note and all of a sudden this place went rattling at the sound of the myriad of angels declaring how holy is the Lord. Could you imagine? Could you imagine being in that place? Man, your heart, you would, you, you would fear for your life. You say, what? <laughs> how am I here? How am I still alive? And that's exactly how he responds in verse 5. He says, woe is me, I cry. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord Almighty. And one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. With it, he touched my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah's sin had been forgiven. One of the seraphim went to the the fire, the throne of God, and picked up one of the coals, came and touched his mouth, and said, your sins are forgiven. Because Isaiah knew that he was an unholy being in the holy of holies, and he was ruined if it was not for the grace of God. And then God lets him in on a conversation with the Trinity. It's as if he said, Isaiah, I want you to stand right here. I'm going to have a conversation the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we are going to allow you to listen in on the conversation. In verse 8, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And Isaiah just (laughs) being cleansed and just seeing the glory of the Lord, how does he respond? He says, here I am, send me. And the Lord said, go. Now I can preach a whole sermon on this. This is my intro. But it's something about seeing the holiness of God and the wonder of God and the beauty of God and the powerfulness of God and receiving the grace of God that lets us see ourselves in our own perspective and now want to serve God because of what he has done for us. See, I think a lot of reasons we don't serve the Lord and we don't do great things for him or at least attempt great things for him is because we don't have a proper vision of him. We, we, we have a, a, a obscured or obstructed view of God and what he's done for us. Back in 1984, a friend of mine 
coworker actually was not from Detroit, moved into Detroit, and the Tigers are on a rampage then, and, and he wanted to go to a Detroit Tigers game, and that's when Tiger Stadium was still around. It was no Comerica Park, it was Tiger Stadium, and, and so he wanted to go so bad, and he wanted me to go with him, and I said, sure, I'll go, and so he got these tickets. And these tickets, any of you who used to go to Tiger Stadium, you know what I'm about to say. You could get tickets, but they were called obstructed view seats. And and obstructed view seats (laughs) meant for us that we were along the right field line, but we were right behind a pole. So you couldn't see right in front of you. You could see where we were sitting. I could see home plate. I could see the catcher, the umpire, the batter. I could see some of the dugout on the third baseline. And I could see right field. But I could not see the infield. And so you really couldn't see everything that was happening. And sometimes they would hit the ball and everybody would stand up. And you didn't know what was going on. So you stand up too, right? You're just just part of it. You, 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 you're in the stadium, but you don't really fully see everything the way you should see it. Sometimes I think that's us. We're in the family of God, and, and, and we know we should respond a certain way because we see how others respond, but we have an obstructed view. Well, now that Isaiah is on fire for the Lord and, and, and the Lord is sending him, he sends him to King Ahaz. So, King Uzziah has a son, and his son's name is Jotham, and then Jotham dies, and Jotham has a son, and his son is Ahaz. And that's where we're going to pick up the story. If you have your Bible, we're going to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 28. But before we go there, you can turn there, but we're going to ask that uh, we would take the offering right now. And you know how it is at Kensington. If this is your first time here, go ahead and uh, allow the, the, the plate or the, uh, the, the basket to pass by you. Also, those of you who are online, you can give mobily. You know the whole deal. We just want to remind you that you are to give to the Lord. But 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 28, we see that Isaiah is going to King Ahaz. And so he is trying to bring the gospel, bring the truth to to King Ahaz. And King Ahaz is in a predicament because he has these other nations that are trying to wipe him out. And uh, 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 Isaiah is coming to give him a word from the Lord. 2 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 1 through 5. Ahaz was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 16 years. Unlike his father David, he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshiping the Baals. He he burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hanum and sacrificed his children in the fire engaging in detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at high places, at the high places, on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. Therefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hands of king of the king of Aram. And the Arameans defeated him and took many of his people as prisoners and brought them to Damascus. He was also given into the hands of the king of Israel, who inflicted heavy casualties on him. So King Ahaz was an ungodly king. He was an individual who did what he wanted to do. Matter of fact, he was following the practices of all the heathen nations that were in the kingdom before Israel came into the land. And he is somebody who did not care for the things of the Lord. You know, one of the things that we have to be reminded of, I think, is we have this hope in Christmas, this hope in God, this hope in the kingdom of God, is that we must remind ourselves that our hope is not in our governing officials. And even though Judah was a kingdom that was supposed to be under the reign of God, the king himself was an evil individual. I think so often in our culture, 
No matter who is in the White House or running, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, too often we as believers put our hope in mankind when we should put our hope in Jesus. Jesus is our hope. We submit to governing authorities, but our hope is always in heaven. You know, I went to undergrad in Michigan State, all right, for, for Sparty, and when I was there, Magic Johnson was there. So that gives you some idea of what, how, how old I am. Magic Johnson was a, a year ahead of me, and I used to love to watch him play, and I really loved him when he played for the Lakers. And one of the things that Magic Johnson did, we all know that he had the, the, what they call no-look passes. He had, the opportunity, he had the ability to be able to come down the court, look this way, and then throw it to somebody over there, and it'd be a perfect pass. He had the ability to see two things at one time. He could focus on one thing, but he also saw something else. We as believers need to be just like that. Yes, we have our eyes on the things of this world, but we also have our eyes in eternity. And so here it is, the nation of Judah is dependent upon Ahaz, but Ahaz is an ungodly king. So God calls Isaiah to speak the truth to King Ahaz. And we're going to pick it up here in Isaiah chapter 7. Isaiah chapter 7, we're going to pick it up here. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 3. Then the Lord said to Isaiah, Go out, you and your son, Shear to Shub, to meet Ahab at the end of the aqueduct of the upper pool on the road to the laundress field. Say to him, Be careful, keep calm, and don't be afraid. Do not lose heart because these two smoldering stubs of firewood because of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram, and of the son of Ramalalah. Aram, Ephraim, and Ramalalah's son have plotted your ruin, saying, Let us invade Judah, let us tear it apart, and divide it among ourselves, and make the son of Tabil king over it. Yet this is what the sovereign Lord says. It will not take place. It will not happen. And the Lord spoke to Ahaz, Ask the Lord your God for a sign, whether in the deepest depths or in the highest heights. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Hear now, you house of David. Is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. So here it is. God has sent Isaiah to Ahaz to tell him that God is going to protect him. And Ahaz got the ability to be a hypocrite and to show false humility. Ah, no, 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 I'm, I'm not going to ask God for a sign. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not going to put God to the test. And God sees right through that foolishness and says, since you won't give me a, you won't, won't ask for a sign, I will give you a sign. And the sign will be this, that a virgin will be with child. And his name will be Emmanuel. Now, we got we to unpack that. We got to unpack that because what does that mean? What that means is, as we understand Old Testament, as we study the Old Testament, we understand these things. I just give you a little seminary lesson. There is near-term prophecy and old-term pro- old, old, a far-term prophecy. Near-term, far-term. What that means is, is that God says that something is going to happen in the future, but it's going to be in the near future. And what happens in the near future is validation that since that came true, what's going to happen in the distant future is going to come true as well. So you see both. This is the proof, and therefore you can trust that I'm going to do the thing in the distant future because I did the thing in the near future. Now, what's going on? So there's evidently a young lady who the probability of her getting married is almost nil. We don't know who it is, 
but it is somebody that Ahaz knows and also Isaiah knows. So between the two of them, they know who that young lady is. And he, Isaiah is saying that young lady who has a slim possibility of being married and having a child will get married and will have one, and that will be proof that God has sent me. But there's also the far term. And the far term is, is that there will be a virgin that will actually have a child. Now, Ahaz would understand that the probability of her (laughs) getting married and having a child is preposterous. But if that happened, then man, the thing that was happening in the future will also come to pass. God gives us preposterous statements to believe because he can do the impossible. He can make the impossible possible. That is not an issue for him. Sometimes it's hard for us to believe. Like in, in 2010, you probably remember this, the uh, uh, Chilean down in Chile, those 33 miners got, got, got caught down in a, in a copper mine, and they were down there for like two months, and the probability of them being saved or, or rescued, all of them alive, I mean, that was a low probability. But yet it would happen. I know some of us were praying that it would happen, but, but, but it happened with, with man, even with man, they can overcome these low probabilities. But God can do the absolute miraculous, so if a virgin were to actually have a child, that would be absolutely miraculous. But Isaiah is saying it will happen. Well, I want to continue on here. He also gives us a description, a description of that virgin who will have a child, a description of that child. What will that child look like, Emmanuel, God with us? Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the greatness of his government and and peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, established and upholding it with justice and righteousness from kingdom uh, uh, from, from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. This child, not only born of a virgin, but will be king of kings. He will be the governor. He will be the one who will reign, not just now, but for all eternity. He is the one who will be sitting on the throne of his father, David. Now, I'm going to tell you, this whole thing is just mind-blowing. If I was living in Israel's time and I heard this, I'm like, man, a child, a son is going to be born of a virgin, and this child is going to reign from his father David's throne in Israel, and he is going to reign for all time. And he is going to be the individual who is going to bring peace on the earth, and all things will be made right. And this is who Israel was looking for. This this was their hope. They were looking for him to come. But they were looking for him to come in power. And so they miss the beauty of him coming as a suffering servant who would die for our sin. And that his kingdom 
would be an everlasting kingdom that would be open not just to Jews, but to Gentiles as well. But here's the deal. Most of us miss who this child actually is or who he was or who he was who he is and who he is to always be. The apostle John, this didn't get by him, didn't get by him. He knew exactly who that child was. Who wants to turn to John chapter 12? John chapter 12. In John chapter 12, Jesus is doing a lot of ministry. He is doing a lot of ministry. He is healing. He is feeding. He is doing all the things that we see in the gospel. And certain people are believing, but there's still a group of people who are not believing. Seeing, they do not see. Hearing, they do not hear. They don't perceive exactly who Jesus is. And so John records all this, but then he gives a commentary. In in, in chapter 12, verse 41, he gives his commentary. And he says, Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus glory and spoke about him. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Isaiah lived 700 years before Jesus was born. When did Isaiah see Jesus' glory? Oh, Isaiah 6, I saw the Lord seated on the throne and cherubim with six wings on either side. With two wings, they covered their eyes. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two wings, they flew. And they yelled, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. John says that that babe that Isaiah prophesied about was actually the Lord of glory who came in human flesh as a little baby and lived a sinless life who died a terrible death and rose from the grave and now is seated back on his throne. And one day, he is coming back for all of us who have put our faith and trust in him. Christmas is a reminder that Jesus is our hope. And just as he came the first time, The Lord of glory who does not lie will come back again for all of us who love his appearing. Father God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. 
We thank you for this reminder that Jesus is our hope. That the Lord of glory who sits on the throne, that the angels could not bear to look upon because of his holiness, is the one who came and died for our sin and rose from the grave demonstrating his power over death and will one day return for us. Jesus, you are our hope. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
as we come before you today may you remove the obstructions from our view and let us see you more clearly today and may the hope that you bring to us no matter the circumstances may that hope transcend may that hope give us life may that hope be what we point to in this season and experience with expectation of what you will do in and through our entire community. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, can we give it up for Dr. Eric Moore? Give him a big thank you. Appreciate you so much and uh, love that we've been partnered together. Um, one of the things as we continue this journey towards Advent is we hope that as we take every step towards it and as we light another candle next week on this journey that that expectation will continue to come. I hope that as you exit today that you stop and make a platter for your family, enjoy that tradition, maybe a new one or an old one that you're bringing back. And uh, we look forward to seeing you next week. If you want prayer, our team would love to pray with you up front on in the lobby, stop by the hub if you want to get connected. God bless you and have a great week.